Thank you for joining the webinar Space Diplomacy and Humanitarian Intervention, the case of Ukraine and beyond. I'm Giovanni Zanaldo, the director of the Duke Center for International Global Studies and the co-chair of the Space Diplomacy Lab. This event features space security law and policy expert, Professor Sadia Pekkanen from the University of Washington in conversation with members of the Rethinking Diplomacy Program Space Diplomacy Lab. Dr. Spitt is going to introduce the speaker and moderate the discussion with other team members and attendees. This event is part of the Space Diplomacy Webinar Series organized by the Center for International Global Studies, Rethinking Diplomacy Program, thanks to a grant from the Joshua Charles Trent Memorial Foundation Endowment Fund. Thank you for, to the attendees for being here with us today. And of course, a special thank you to Professor Pekkanen and uh, my colleague uh, Benjamin will uh, start introduce the speaker more formally. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, my name is Dr. Benjamin L. Schmidt. I'm a uh, research associate at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, and I'm also a co-founder along with Giovanni of the Duke University Center for International and Global Studies Space Diplomacy Lab. Uh, we've been focused in this program uh, for uh, almost two years now on science and in particular space diplomacy. Uh, issues and earlier this year kicked off um, a, uh, uh, a a focused uh, program uh, in terms of the space diplomacy lab uh, to really continue to dive into these uh, urgent space diplomacy issues where we're uh, trying to work for the uh, safe and sustainable use of outer space and in particular low Earth orbit. Uh, but today uh, we're here to focus on uh, humanitarian issues with respect to space. Since Russia began its full-scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24, data from government and commercial space assets has helped the general public understand the, the trajectory of the war in a really transformative way. For diplomats and aid workers, the growing availability of data from satellite-based imagers has helped to drive diplomatic strategies to support Ukrainian sovereignty while providing the capability to deliver aid to Ukrainian citizens in need. Furthermore, coupling these image sets with communications capabilities that have now been provided by distributed satellite-based internet platforms, such as uh, uh, from uh, SpaceX's uh, Starlink's pro Starlink program, uh, uh, diplomats and aid workers have also been able to devise humanitarian evacuation corridors and support regional food and water security while remotely assessing the state of uh, civilian critical infrastructure across the country. So with all of this in mind, there's much to be learned from the role that space assets have played in delivering humanitarian assistance uh, to Ukraine uh, in the conflict so far uh, this year, both to understand what more can be done in particular to support the Ukrainian people right now and also to apply these space-enabled uh, diplomatic and aid strategies uh, to other ongoing and future global challenges. Um, so we are so thrilled uh, to be joined today uh, at the Space Diplomacy Lab uh, to welcome space uh, security law and policy expert, Professor Sadia Pekkanen, the Job and Gertrude Tamaki Endowed Professor at the Jackson School of International Studies and Adjunct Professor in the School of Law, both at the University of Washington. And so with that, I am thrilled to hand this over for opening remarks uh, from Dr. Pekkanen, uh, after which we'll have a roundtable discussion with the Space Diplomacy Lab. And of course, uh, welcome uh, anyone from the audience to also submit questions via the Q&A feature uh, that we can ask uh, and discuss with folks uh, in the Space Diplomacy Lab and of course with Dr. Pekkanen. So Dr. Pekkanen, over to you sitting right next to the space needle. <laughs> sitting right next to the space needle. Thank you so much uh, to Giovanni and Ben for this invitation. And thank you also to the Space Diplomacy Lab at Duke University Center for International and Global Studies and to the Jos uh, Josiah Charles Trent Memorial Foundation Endowment Fund for helping make this timely event uh, possible. It's really a great pleasure for me to be here and I'm looking forward to this conversation with Giovanni and Ben and you all on an issue of rising and central importance in the world today. Now, what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to reflect on broad themes about a specific set of space assets and their role in world politics today. And I want to use the Ukraine case to raise bigger issues of interest. The Ukraine war gives us an opportunity to reflect on what is going into place above us in space and what it means for affecting prospects for security as well as humanitarian outcomes around us. Now, if you will permit me, I should also add that the basis 
for my remarks comes from two prongs of my own research. One is a paper titled, A Small Satellite's Big Data and International Security. This was a multi-year project with colleagues and it will be coming out in the journal International Security in the fall. We have been tracking for the past several years what is just now rising in public consciousness because of the Ukrainian uh, war. The other set of research I'll be using for my remarks in our conversation is the Oxford Handbook of Space Security, which I am co-editing. This has 50 plus space security, IR and strategic studies analysts spread around the world, and it is currently underway, but nearing completion. And I want to use all that research really to make two big points that are relevant for our discussion today. First, it is true that the pertinent space technology frontier I'm going to discuss, and we call it small satellites, big data, but I'm just going to shorten that to SSBD uh, for the purposes of not saying it over and over. I would say that SSBD is certainly foundational for mapping what is going on. And I want to give you a concrete sense of what that means, who the players are, and what exactly we are looking at. Second, building on this research, I want to offer some reflections on the immediate promise, but also the longer term challenges of what SSBD might mean in world politics more broadly. Right now, satellite-based public attribution is getting much attention, uh, as Ben was just uh, talking about. And much of this attention is certainly positive as in building support for humanitarian work. But we are still at the very early stages of trying to grapple with SSBD and its consequences for shaping political and social realities. And some of what we can reasonably foresee means that law, policy, and diplomacy need to move in lockstep with the technology if we want to leverage it for lawful and peaceful purposes. So there's a part that we know, and there's a part that we're just beginning to see unfold that presents important opportunities to reflect and learn and build. And I think we'll get into these conversations uh, in just a moment. With that, let me begin first with what we are talking about, the part we can be sure about, the specific technology. Now, stepping back, and I probably don't have to tell this audience, but we know uh, that space assets, primarily satellites, form a critical digital infrastructure for all spacefaring powers. They invisibly empower economic, environmental, and social understanding, as well as military and defense realities intertwined with cyber and nuclear security. We have known all this for a very long time. And of course, the safety and security of that infrastructure is of great interest to all space specialists and intertwined also with the topic of orbital debris and national security space threats. Today, that space-based infrastructure is expanding in unprecedented ways with small satellites and mega constellations. Small satellites are now capable of rather sophisticated remote sensing and are inexpensive enough to manufacture, to launch and operate thanks to rapid growth in the commercial satellite and launch sectors. These emerging technology frontiers are led today by US innovators like Maxar and Planet and Capella and Black Sky and Hawkeye, as well as SpaceX and Amazon. We're advancing new small sat architectures for connecting and seeing the world night or day and through all kinds of weather conditions. The United States is not alone, of course, in advancing these technology frontiers. In Finland and Japan, for example, we also see the same trends with companies such as ISI and Axelspace and Synspective. What these companies are doing commercially is highly consequential for wartime and peacetime. And here is why. SSBD already enhanced capabilities for persistent wide area detection of events, their attribution to specific actors, and their classification of their, these events as hostile, harmful, or unlawful or not with fairly reasonable accuracy. The gathering force of these technologies means that over time, we will pretty much be able to detect, attribute, and classify much of what is going on on the planet's surfaces. In terms of human activities, this includes all civilian, commercial, military, public, and private events and operations. Anything that can be counted and seen from space will be counted and recorded, sold, and disseminated. And if the technology stays the course, we will do this better and better and faster and faster. States, indeed anyone who can really pay, stand to have unprecedented capabilities to address security challenges virtually anywhere on the planet's surfaces. Ukraine proves it. 
SSBD also means that users of the world's physical surfaces, whether on land or oceans, whether public or private, should be made fully aware that they will be operating in a more transparent environment than has ever existed in all of history, and that all their behaviors, the good and the bad, will be visible. Anonymity is under unprecedented assault, and it may soon be gone forever. These realities, which have come together in the last decade or so, have been of keen interest not just to investors and traders looking for leading economic indicators, but also to the military, law enforcement sectors, and national security establishments around the world. As we watch these actors move to harness these new technology frontiers, it is clear that SSBD is not a flash in the pan. It is the new reality around us today. It is this expanding infrastructure, this SSBD reality that is of interest to us today. And we have a fairly good grip on its technology potential. But what comes next is a little less certain and understanding and work on the impact of SSBD is just beginning. So this brings me to the second big point, to the wartime case of Ukraine, which raises, I think, an opportunity to learn about satellite-based public attribution and real-time transparency. Ukraine happened just as we were wrapping up the paper I mentioned earlier, which was extraordinary to see what we had been studying obscurely begin to play out on the front pages of the world's news. We have a good sense of how it all began and what is happening now. We knew right at the start from satellite imagery in the public domain, for example, when Russian troops were amassing on the Ukrainian border and what that might portend. We could see the military convoys moving along the operations as operations got underway in Ukraine. But we know this too, being watched and knowing that did not stop the Russian aggression and invasion. That said, on the more heartening civilian side, while we cannot say for how much or for how long, almost 90 days into a full-scale invasion and war, we can say this. Satellite-based public attribution based on real-time images may sway, enable, and support the prospects for more humanitarian aid in Ukraine. Satellite-based imagery is, of course, not the only thing that is doing this. On-the-ground reporters and photographers, I think, matter greatly, and more so in some ways, I would say, because they're close to their human subjects. But we see the constant emotional and big-picture security appeal of SSBD in real time, almost as events happen. Ukraine shows us how our everyday civilian lives may be seen in wartime. That is, when the lights go out in cities, when bombs turn hospitals to rubble, when critical infrastructure is destroyed, when workers bury the dead in mass graves, when ports are blockaded and ships get stuck, when people and children flee across borders. From these images, we can infer, build a mental map, horrifying as that may be, of the kinds of things that may have devastated the lives of 14 million Ukrainians who are estimated to have fled their homes since the inv invasion began. Six million who have left for no neighboring countries and I think eight million displaced inside Ukraine. And all of them, as the United Nations is saying, needing relief and protection in the coming months. The emotional appeal of this constant imagery no doubt motivates the work of nonprofits, of corporations, of governments and international organizations focused on the relief and protection of civilian populations. It affirms the importance of humanitarian corridors for the protections of civilians and for the delivery of food and water and other basic necessities. It reminds us of the importance of food security, not just in Ukraine, but worldwide, as the United Nations is warning. Ukraine also reinforces the importance of having satellite-based internet platforms, especially in areas where there are no cables or cell to towers, or these are deliberately destroyed, to ensure that communication and connectivity for civilians on the ground, whether they're in one place or whether they are fleeing. SpaceX has, of course, famously donated a Starlink terminals and has worked hard to ensure that they remain mobile and immune to attacks. While all these patterns are emerging, others are too. What goes for the civilian side also goes for the military side. And I cannot stress this enough. Satellite imagery is in essence non-discriminatory. It sees a civilian school bus the same way it sees a military tank. 
And I want to briefly end with some broader lessons that are cross, cut across this civilian military device that arise from our research and should make us more vigilant for what lies ahead. One thing uh, is that satellite-based public attribution is fragile. As we have all learned, digital data are prone to manipulation and disinformation, and of course, they have to filter through our own interpretive beliefs and views. Seeing is not believing, and it is not clear who gets to decide what we selectively see and why. This means we should take seriously the likelihood of propaganda wars or wars of narratives rising as well. Another cautionary note that I want to sound is that while we might think transparency is likely to induce more lawful behavior, our research suggests that transparency can also be turned on its head if the aggressor can reasonably and incrementally show that there is no united or lasting resolve to oppose its activities. This means that building and sustaining collaborative frameworks preemptively is critical and is not something that can be done on the fly or when the moment demands it. And finally, we do need to keep in mind that a space-based infrastructure which confers informational advantages to the other side is of course a target for kinetic and non-kinetic attacks, especially in wartime. This is not theoretical, but a possibility that has arisen in the Ukrainian uh, war. Communication that can be enabled for civilians can also of course serve military personnel. This means that the protection of the space assets also demands attention if they are to serve the interests of humanity, whether in wartime or peacetime. All that said, I think these challenges to my mind really reinforce the importance of a tech plus strategy in and beyond Ukraine. Technology alone will not serve human interest. To affect and build support for ground truth, for the rule of law and peaceful prospects requires human agency, interactions, policy and diplomacy. So along with persistent satellite-based imagery and signals and communications, these are the kinds of human-centered activities which I think will rise in importance as we think about what it takes to build and sustain lawful frameworks for safety, security, and humanitarian outcomes in the world. I will leave you with that. Thank you so much for listening. I'm looking forward to your remarks and conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Pekin. And those were excellent uh, overview of uh, small satellites, big data, a great way of encapsulating um, the, the issue set that we're, we're thinking about today in terms of humanitarian aid for Ukraine and, uh, and the role of space um, platform, you know, space, space uh, technology platforms uh, to support um, diplomacy on the ground as well. I mean, you know, I, uh, I, I know that we have, uh, as part of our space diplomacy lab, Ambassador uh, Bob Pearson, who's, who's going to, uh, of course, make uh, an intervention uh, very soon. I also uh, worked at the State Department uh, in the not too um, distant past. Uh, and I think that for both of us, um, the idea of having pro, you know, a, a proliferated amount of space, uh, open source, private sector data is really transformative uh, in, in the sense that um, you know, maybe in the past, even five to 10 years ago, there was uh, this kind of uh, hysteresis in the system where, yeah, uh, you know, we had the technology, but a lot of it was government technology where it would be classified and take years to declassify uh, before it could actually uh, serve uh, broader use for humanitarian means. Whereas now we're seeing in, in terms of uh, the, um, you know, the, the uh, illegal invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia, um, you know, space imagers uh, in, you know, multi-spectral space imagers, whether they're uh, optical or infrared, et cetera, um, giving a host of data. You know, so we're, we're seeing vital evidence uh, of Russian war crimes, in particular in, in Bucha and in Mariupol, uh, destruction of Ukrainian civil infrastructure uh, that includes energy infrastructure that has had a significant impact on European energy security uh, discussions, as well as energy sanctions discussions, um, agricultural food security issues, the blocking of Odessa and, um, and discussions that are really, you know, right in the headlines right now in terms of uh, addressing food security. And of course, uh, refugee evacuation corridors and humanitarian aid delivery. So I guess I want to start by just kind of framing this, um, you know, from your perspective and, and maybe for the audience, how transformative of a moment are we at in terms of this being used as so, so-called open source intelligence, right? We've seen these, uh, um, you know, Twitter accounts, uh, open source uh, intelligence aggregators and analysts 
uh, really be able to impact the media space in terms of you know, reporting on this and also uh, obviously have direct impact on swaying public opinion um, in countries where the United States and its partners and allies have, have had to rally diplomatic support. So is this new? I mean, we've seen things like this in Syria and Yemen, but is this a really a new paradigm that we're seeing? And, and if so, um, how do we seize that going forward? Mm. Uh, that's an excellent question, Ben. And I think... Um... It, the, I would say that the technology and the availability of data is, of course, transformative. Um, and it does affect uh, this constant surveillance does, in fact, affect uh, our ability to be able to check, do not just see, but also address any kind of security challenges around the world. The issue of who owns the data and whether or not it's free is important to remember in the context that th these are commercial companies interested in a profit. And of course, they need buyers uh, uh, to, uh, uh, you know, for their products and their analytic services. So yes, open source intelligence, I think, you know, I think that that is a very important rising field, but there's also uh, still will continue to be some sort of selective use of these data. So my point is that we need to think more about how we will use this massive availability of data at our fingertips to sort of inform our understanding of what is going on. The other point I will make is that um, more data is not necessarily a guarantee of lawful and peaceful outcomes, right? Just because you have more data doesn't mean that um, uh, you can either sway the public, you still have to filter this through uh, you know, human-centered lenses and all the social context in which that is happening. And in addition, uh, depending on the selective introduction of what data or images we get to see, we may build a one-sided uh, 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 one sided picture of what is going on. And I think you can also see strands of this beginning to play out in the Ukraine war. So my purpose in offering my remarks was uh, that absolutely it is transformative, but absolutely we need to think very carefully about how it's being used, who is using it, what are the potential negative and positive consequences of this data, and whose interests are we really uh, serving uh, as this data continues to unfold? It will continue to unfold. We are, you know, there's no question that that will happen, but uh, how we use it to really transform and work for, uh, you know, broader goals in the interests of humanity is, I think, very, very central. Okay, well, we have, as a direct follow-up to that question, uh, a, a Q&A uh, that came in from the audience. I then will turn to uh, Dr. Lindsey Gray uh, and then Ambassador Bob Pearson to uh, to ask their follow-up questions. Uh, but first, um, from Patrick Duddy in the audience, uh, we have uh, a question that says, we live in an age in which we are awash in data and we know the data can be manipulated. Is there a way, a technology to validate and or test open source data? And in particular, um, I, I think this speaks to what you're saying in terms of big data, you know, what sort of uh, analytics, AI, uh, vetting, um, you know, machine learning, uh, uh, technologies are necessary to get us to a point where we can verify and then get those into context for space law. You know, if we're talking about, for example, um, war crimes tribunals in the future that are are reliant on open source um, space-based assets that are showing, um, you know, mass graves and and other atrocities on the ground. Um, you know, how you know how do you verify that? How do you use that as a uh, as a as a tool in diplomacy and international law? Yeah, no, I think that that is an excellent question. And this is what I'm saying is that this is a moment for us all to learn. We see the importance of this data going into place. The kind of thinking that you're, um, that the, the audience member is raising is extremely important, which is how do you verify and know that what you are being told is true is actually true. So I would say that one thing that we can right off the bat say is that um, we need to think about triangulating uh, the evidence uh, from different sources and then have people say, uh, you know, we sort of confirm that there are collaborative points and collaborative platforms that are building the same composite picture. How we consistently use this imagery and the data as well as the machine learning to convince people about fact-based narratives is I think an extremely critical task. And that's not a technology part. That is really a law and policy and diplomatic uh, part, but it is here, and we are sort of beginning to see that uh, unfold in the context of SSBD, uh, and it is something that I think deserves, uh, well, it deserves definitely to research, 
but also really hard thinking about because the answer is not completely apparent. Great, thank you so much. Uh, I will turn to uh, Dr. Gray, Lindsay, please. Thank you so much, fascinating talk. And my question is also a kind of segueing off of your recent comments. And I'd really like to ask about your impression and the future needs of cybersecurity as we continue to use satellite data for humanitarian purposes. Mm -hmm. I do think it is incredibly exciting to have satellites being able to really step in and fill this void of a data um, deficiency and to provide a map for things like humanitarian routes for access and evacuation routes. But we also know from this war with Ukraine and Russia that the dangers of being hacked have never been higher. And in fact, particularly from the Russian government under the Putin regime, we have seen an increase in the amount of cyber attacks in our satellites, in outer space. So that same data that could be used to provide tremendous aid could also be used to fine tune targets and to really be used to really hone an attack. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit on kind of where we are situationally in making sure that our cybersecurity measures are lockstep in line with the improvements that we are having in humanitarian development and aid from kind of this big data, new age that we are in, in space diplomacy. What an excellent uh, question. And you go to the heart of uh, uh, what is really, I think, of interest to a lot of space security specialists. Like, how do we really uh, ensure uh, that this uh, SSBD architecture continues to remain in place and continue to sort of help with civilian and commercial realities that we're bringing, including uh, humanitarian realities. Now, let me say that cyber attacks are not a hypothetical. I think that we've already seen that, um, uh, that arise in the context of the Ukrainian war, and uh, we should fully expect that they will continue to arise. So the question is not uh, whether or not it will happen, but you know, how do you sort of mitigate that? So one, uh, the feature of this architecture that is going into place is, of course, resilience. So, okay, you know, you you hack into one satellite, perhaps if it's not connected in terms of um, uh, to other satellites, uh, we have a resilient architecture in uh, uh, in place. So. You're absolutely correct. And the intersection of space and cyber, I think for most security specialists, you know, we don't think of, uh, you know, the uh, what's uh, the space assets as being distinct from the towers and the links and um, the signals that are going upstream and, uh, you know, uplink and downlink. It's all part and parcel of the same thing. So it's not just cyber attacks. It's also the protection of the uh, ground stations. Uh, that are disseminating this is their connection to other uh, 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 you know internet users that are relying on that uh, data. So um, are we worried uh, to see this kind of possibility rising? Yes, absolutely. But I think we've learned something by what is happening in terms of cyber attacks on the ground. They, these are very difficult to attribute. And I think uh, we will see what that might mean in the context of the SSBD architecture, but that is absolutely something as part of a non-kinetic attack on these, uh, uh, you know, for these satellites that I think can be very important to the functions that they may serve for humanitarian or other uh, purposes. Again, I would also say uh, is that, this is only just now dawning on people that we could have cyber attacks, whereas, you know, most people have sort of anticipated that this was going to be ha happening. And in particular, if you think about the Internet going into space, uh, being beamed or connected um, uh, from space, that possibility will arise. Uh, there's no question uh, that that is a threat that we need to sort of think about very carefully moving forward. So if you do research on that, I'd love to hear <laughs> what, what the conclusions are from your end as well. That, that's very important part of research. Great, and I, I will just say, I mean, that's, that's uh, I mean, we're talking about this. This is, again, ripped from the headlines. Um, you know, just last week, it took two months, uh, but then there was eventually attribution from the United States and a number of transatlantic partners and allies of Russia's digital assault against the Biostat uh, network. That's right. Um, and, uh, you know, that had not only um, uh, impact on satellite-based internet and internet providers uh, in Ukraine, but also spillover effect in the European Union, which of course can have, uh, you know, real diplomatic consequences as the conflict goes on. But as you say, it's it takes time uh, for attribution and um, it's very hard 
in terms of these uh, space security situations to often have real time attribution um, as uh, as conflicts um, you know, right. go on in uh, in rapidly evolving scenarios. So I will next turn to uh, Ambassador Bob Pearson uh, to ask our next question from the Space Diplomacy Lab. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Peckin, and I really appreciated your terrific remarks. Uh, and to be honest with you, I appreciated your enthusiasm as much as your intellectual prowess. So uh, it is a subject that fascinates all of us, and uh, we're delighted to have you with us today. Um, I wanted to take uh, two really commentaries and put them in front of you and have you react if possible. Um, it's true that conflict is so fascinating to human beings that they are seduced into concentrating on conflict. And as you know, one of our principal purposes is to look at the other segments mm -hmm. of the utility of technologies. And I really appreciate your and Ben's comments about the humanitarian purpose of satellite imagery. And there are any number of things that could be done. So if you have other thoughts about, uh, even speculation, about how the imagery and the data could be used for humanitarian purposes, that would be uh, very interesting. And in that light, often when people talk of conflict, the other issues, food security, energy transformation, migration, uh, become a kind of and furthermore topic. So they talk about the conflict and furthermore, there's a crisis in A, B, and C. But actually A, B, and C may have consequences that last longer and are more complicated than the war does. So if you could look at that area and give us some of your insight, that would be wonderful. And the other point I'll just put out there for you to think about and comment on if you'd like, is that we are also focused on solution finding. Uh, it is uh, no crime to discuss in detail the aspects of the difficulty of a situation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important to know. But on the other hand, when you get to the end of that discussion, someone has to do something about it. Mm -hmm. So if you could help us uh, again with your thoughts about how we start engaging diplomatically and in policy terms, even at a national level, the National Space Council, uh, if just to take one example, but also international fora to actually begin to engage on these problems as separate priorities, not just as functions of conflict. That would also be very helpful. So thank you very much. Oh, um, th those are wonderful. Um, th that what you raise is an extremely uh, wonderful, but I, I fully agree with you that conflict is not the way that we would have liked to have introduced the idea of SSBD. When we started, we were looking at uh, its impact on the environmental, on understanding an environmental uh, situation, understanding uh, what it was doing for economic uh, competition. And then along came the war. And then conflict, of course, concentrates everybody's mind. So you got a sense for what this imagery uh, can um, actually do. How can it be used for humanitarian purposes? I think is the protection of the corridors that are actually being set. And I believe that they set them up in, um, I think Russia and Ukraine agreed in March that there would be humanitarian corridors. So what our satellite imagery can do uh, is it can monitor whether or not those corridors are actually uh, uh, you know, safe, and that the people in them as they're moving along, or even as refugee camps are set up, for example, they're not harmed in any way, because civilian protection is of the utmost importance uh, in a situation uh, like this. So imagery can certainly help us do that. Data can also help us do that. But we don't necessarily need uh, satellite imagery for that. We can also use boots on the ground reporters and photographers who can supplement some of those bigger uh, pictures. It's just that we can do it over a wider scope so we get a better sense of what is going on across the entire uh, landscape. So I think that that can be very, very important for monitoring uh, whether or not those uh, corridors remain protected from military assault, uh, just to put it uh, bluntly. I also really deeply appreciate your point that the subjects that arise as a consequence of war, uh, you know, are themselves 
worthy of investigation and sustained attention, not just simply as casualties of war, but as subjects in their own right. And you mentioned um, energy, food security, migration, and all those things are important. And they are, of course, they can also be observed by our satellites. So for example, if you are interested in uh, migration patterns or particular uh, borders and how people are crossing across those borders, we will begin to uh, have imagery over time that tells us exactly how many are crossing. We'll be able to sell the size of the crowds. So we can count all those things, we can see all those things, and that's all great. Uh, but as you are pointing out correctly, what do we do with all this imagery? And I will be honest with you, uh, I think we're at the very early stages of really thinking through who will act, on what basis they will act, and with what purpose in mind they will act, right? So even within the United States, yes, uh, you know, we have uh, uh, places like the State Department, uh, of course, and then uh, the National Space Council as a way perhaps to begin to understand what is going on. But I think that right now SSBD has not really fully hit the public in terms of what it means. So our objective in this paper was to say, look, we fully understand that there is this other piece that needs to come out of this, but let us first at least figure out whether we can discern any impact on the ground. Is it changing events or behavior towards lawful and peaceful activities? And so far what we are finding uh, is the one lesson that we're walking away with is that technology alone and whatever that technology is producing is not the solution. We do need to preemptively think about the, the frameworks, whether we're do, doing this through um, national authorities or an international forum like the United Nations uh, for conversation, just to raise awareness of the issues. We're a long way. We're a long way uh, from those kinds of collaborative uh, frameworks. I think that the institution that is also going to get um, be involved in this, and we begin to see some of the glimmers of this in the paper, is how uh, courts might be uh, involved in terms of the usage uh, of this uh, imagery. And um, whether it's the International Court of Justice or whether it's national courts, those are also another important avenue for thinking about what is or is not permissible in terms of the evidence that we begin to get in order to hold um, uh, people accountable or to begin to build a sort of frameworks that help with collaboration as we move uh, forward. You're absolutely correct to point out, uh, we have some sense of the technology, this is what I'm saying in my remarks, we have some sense of what the technology is doing. We have the Ukraine cases telling us something, but do we have things in place that can help us use this technology in the public interest for humanitarian reasons, for the protection of civilians? We're a long way from that. We're a long way from that. But I'm grateful to institutions and platforms also like the Space Diplomacy Lab because they help us think about these issues and raise awareness about them. So I, I see that as a necessary first step in sort of moving uh, towards more policy and diplomatic uh, solutions. We're at the very early stages. So that's what I want to say to you, Ambassador. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Sadia. We now have a question from the audience, uh, the Atlantic's uh, Marina Corin is uh, asking for Sadia. You said yes. in your opening remarks that yes. soon anything uh, that can be counted or seen from space will be, and that info will be disseminated and sold. Is that troubling for you at all? At what point is space technology going too far? So um, thank you for that uh, question. Uh, is it troubling? Yes, from a privacy perspective, of course, uh, this is, uh, uh, you know, it does raise significant concerns that, uh, you know, we, in, in one sense, the selective imagery that you see in the Ukraine conflict, it's all about military operations. But the honest truth is that the same technology is also a lens for looking into private lives. And yes, uh, you know, you might, you might find it troubling to think that all this information is being disseminated and sold it's already being disseminated and sold. Uh, so the question is, you know, who are the people or the countries or the governments who are interested in sort of buying uh, this um, technology and the imagery and the data that it's producing and to what ends is this actually being 
uh, put. We don't have any regulation or control of what governments do, but uh, those contracts are already in place. Uh, that data are already being generated. Those data are already being uh, sold. Uh, and yes, I do think that we need to raise awareness about this because it fundamentally affects the lives uh, of uh, you know every single person on the planet. Um, so how we sort of live in this fishbowl and whether or not it affects our behavior in good or bad ways, all of that is uh, something that I think we should realize we're stepping into. So that's where we are uh, in, 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 in the world order at this moment. The technology is already sort of gone into place. The question is really what we do uh, with the imagery that comes out. I think that that is an extremely uh, important thing to deal with. And um, as I say, we're at the very early stages of that. I'll just add a, a quick follow-up on that, uh, Dr. Pekinen. Um, I mean, at, at what point is there a legal threshold for what can be used or um, you know, what, what sort of space technology data can be taken? It seems that under the Outer Space Treaty and um, the, the nascent norms that we have in this, this area, um, that uh, basically, if you're across the threshold of space, over you know, and you're doing overflight, anything goes, uh, which is much different from when you're inside of Earth's atmosphere in an aircraft or something like that. So, can you just speak to that in terms of norm setting uh, for what Marina was asking? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yes, you're absolutely correct. You know, I mean, that is uh, because I think that understanding is already there. This is what has allowed this new SSB new technology to also go into place. What we're talking about is constant surveillance. This is persistent. It is uh, data about the same spot over and over again over time. So you can build a composite. The, the question is, uh, can we use that in courts? I think that that conversation and that reality is also beginning to hit the courts, uh, including international courts as well as uh, national courts. But what is the threshold? I don't know what the answer is uh, there. And what are the uses that are going to govern it, especially if the image that you think uh, you know, is somehow selective can also be disseminated and bought by anybody uh, with respect to some event or operation. So as you can see, as the data sort of spill across all aspects of our lives, there's nothing that is now sort of hidden. Uh, you know, we're all sort of living uh, in this uh, fishbowl. So the idea of norm setting and the uses of these data, I think, is an extremely important one. It also, of course, uh, affects... Um, just in the ordinary, uh, you know, in our ordinary civilian lives, that I think is an important avenue uh, to keep uh, thinking about. The other avenue that I think is also important to think about is what does it do for neutrality? Uh, and what we think about is neutrality between belligerent and non belligerent states, because as you pointed out, states have, under the Outer Space Treaty, responsibility for continuing supervisory authority of, uh, you know, all. Uh, activities and assets of their uh, national uh, private companies. So that also is an area that I think we need to sort of think about. I think lawyers and policy analysts and space security specialists need to sort of begin to think, sit down and think about what that norm setting might look like. And Ben, you have worked on, uh, you work on orbital debris, for example, you have a sense of how hard that has been in orbital uh, debris. And here uh, we are talking, and that's orbital debris. Yes. So now here you are talking about norm setting in a way that fundamentally affects the lives and behavior of human beings and governments and corporations and uh, people on the planet. We have a long way to go uh, to sort of uh, first to understand what it is that we're looking at and second to begin to think about what that norm setting behavior, uh, that norm setting process might even look like. So I think part of the reason I'm so grateful to you, this is really the first time that I've sort of presented this work, um, is that it is an opportunity for me, Ukraine is an opportunity to really reflect hard about what is or is not possible about norm setting behavior and about what it shows us about aggressive and lawful conduct on the ground and who will hold us accountable if we don't pursue lawful and uh, peaceful conduct on the ground. The answers are not clear uh, to my mind. So I think that that is something that we need to think about very carefully too. Well, in incredibly important comments. And, and if we had a poll feature going, I might ask how many uh, folks on this call are going to run out and buy golf umbrellas 
uh, to walk around the streets, uh, even when it's not raining. Uh, from, from uh, so I'll, I'll go back to uh, Dr. Lindsey Gray uh, for our yes, next question. Of course. Sadia, I'd love to circle back to a particular type of space technology that you mentioned earlier in your talk, and that is the, the provision of internet access to areas that are either um, do not have the type of infrastructure development needed to have that service provided widely to their populations, or in the cases like Ukraine, where due to conflict and the destruction of infrastructure, there needs to be some sort of additional input to that way people have that access to information for their own safety and well-being. Now, I know when we think about um, the situation in Ukraine, we, we often turn to how that was an opportunity for Starlink to really come in and provide that type of assistance to the Ukrainian people. But when you take a little bit of a step back and you look at the main providers of that internet access to these kind of situations, and then also again to those low middle income countries that are still needing this type of development, we are dealing with a pretty small set of players and in maybe more cynical views, um, sometimes the term space barons is used. Mm -hmm. And so the question that I have is about the stability of that dynamic and what sort of landscape changes we ideally need to see in space to avoid a kind of situation that we saw in global health only a short while ago with the dissolvement of the Bill and Melinda Gates marriage yeah. that resulted in shock waves of fear and disruption in global health and humanitarian programming across the world. So what sort of changes in business landscapes and diversity of players do we ideally need to see in space? And if, if that's not needed, like what is giving you reassurance that we're not gonna see that type of situation happen again? Ah, so um, what a wonderful and thoughtful uh, question. Let me say first, let me begin on the positive side. I think that the purposes of uh, players like, uh, let's say, uh, OneWeb or Starlink or Amazon's uh, Kuiper, um, these are communication uh, things. And as you correctly point out, they help us to think about the urban rural, what we think of as the digital divide. So at some level, that, it sounds like a wonderful mission that, you know, it helps to connect all these people uh, and that can be potentially extremely important, uh, not just in their day-to-day -day commercial and civilian operations, but also uh, in terms of humanitarian um, access, right? So what if there is a disaster? If we have uh, this, you know, they have this technology in place, we might be able to help the people in the rural area. So the emphasis on the digital divide and sort of bridging and helping to visit, not just within the United States, but also across the entire globe between um, bigger and emerging uh, powers in, in the world, that digital divide, I think it's a really wonderful, noble sounding um, idea. There, there are, of course, problems. One of them that you raised earlier, which is, of course, you know, the more that you have, the bigger the targets, the more the cyber attacks. So, you know, all these things we sort of need to keep at the back of our mind. But And so the stability of the dynamic uh, that you raised, the, the, the idea that there are very few uh, players who are actually shaping uh, what is happening. And, uh, you know, our national authorities are continuing to license uh, the approval of uh, these assets going uh, into uh, place. So is it stable? It's stable in the sense that we know who the players are. Uh, we know that their business is to get into space. We know that they will be selling communication or imagery uh, and data primarily to governments, uh, right? So I think that that's where the contracts are being held. And they're not just subject to, to the, uh, to, uh, they can sell and have contracts anywhere around the world. It is the nature of the technology that it is global, universal, it's accessible to anyone. Is it a stable dynamic? It's stable in the sense that the first uh, sets of players that we see are going to be governments buying this. So you have to think very hard about the balance that this enormous amount of data will have on the balance between states relative to their own societies, one thing. And then the other is the balance between these uh, corporations uh, that are sort of controlling this, if they're commercial, right? Um, uh, that are controlling this uh, landscape or that own this landscape, I think is the uh, the better 
uh, word and um, how they're actually being regulated in terms of what they can and cannot do. So that piece, so it's not the technology. We can see what it's doing. We can see the good and we can also see the concerning or the challenges. Is the part of the uh, the lack of understanding, the, the lack of coordination, the lack both within and across countries, that I think is the piece that we need to work on to address and reassure people that this will be done in the interest of humanity. And uh, so I think that forums like this and platforms like this are very important for sort of sending out a message and raising the public consciousness. And uh, so I think that that's the reassurance that we can sort of give people that, look, we are thinking about it. We've learned a lot over the past 20 years. We've learned about social media. We have learned about the fragility of data. How do we avoid? And we've learned how divisive it can be, right? So it's not just the digital divide that we're talking about. What about digital divisiveness that may come from the selective use of this uh, very imagery and data that is supposed to create a peaceful world? I would say... It is in a very important moment that we want to reflect on how best to do that. And uh, through groups like this and others, as we connect and raise public consciousness, I think that as academics, that is the first step that we can take. Um, and I think that that's the duty that we have in terms of our scholarship to sort of try and raise awareness of what is happening. I think that's a very long-winded answer to I think an extremely important question. Don't have clear answers for you, but we can sort of see amorphously sort of what is coming down the pipeline and also having learned what we learned. Um, I think this time we're walking into it with our eyes wide open. So it's important that we do something about that, um, you know, in, in whatever capacity that we can. Thank you, Sadia. Um, I, I will just cognizant of time. I'm going to ask one last uh, set of questions kind of building on uh, the um, the distributed uh, satellite-based internet mega constellations that that have uh, that uh, that Dr. Gray uh, brought up, um, and and kind of go back, take an opportunity to go back to one of our earlier discussions in our, our series uh, that we had, um, where we had inputs from Professor Britt Lundgren and Professor Laura Newberg, um, uh, who you know have pointed to the impacts on ground-based astronomy that these mega constellations have. So at the same time that we've seen. Uh, you know, Starlink become, uh, you know, indispensable in terms of providing uh, humanitarian coordination in Ukraine, in uh, providing a, an open uh, information environment as the critical infrastructure on the ground in Ukraine uh, is being destroyed by Russia. Um, and also reports that, um, you know, including from uh, the Telegraph uh, uh, newspaper, uh, in, in the UK that uh, that basically the Ukrainian military has also depended on Starlink for command and control of drones, for example. So all incredibly important to protecting Ukrainian sovereignty and protecting uh, humanitarian quarters and all of the uh, all of the things we're talking about today. At the same time, um, we see that uh, you know the, the you know proliferation of uh, small satellites has um, increased the possibility of uh, proliferation of unconstrained space debris. Um, as well as uh, put in danger um, certain parts of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum to ground-based astronomy. So, you know, we were joined by uh, Professor um, uh, Lundgren, who's doing optical astronomy. Of course, myself and uh, Professor Newberg are doing millimeter wavelength astronomy and are, are concerned about the, uh, you know, the uplink, downlink. So that's that's one question. The second question, just because this happened over the past few days, we've seen um, you know, in response to the direct ascent anti satellite weapons test that Russia did last November, um, in on the space debris question, since we're so focused on the safe and sustainable use of outer space in this, this program, um, we've already seen the United States announce on April 18th, uh, 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 Vice President Harris coming out and saying that the US would ban uh, such ground launch destructive orbital tests going forward. And that seems to have set a norm setting process. Uh, with just last week, Canada adopting similar uh, uh, policy uh, and other nations uh, at a UN meeting uh, that was held uh, last week, seemingly ready to follow suit. So where do you think we're going with this? And how do we get all of these various stakeholders involved? You have astronomy, you have policy, you have national security, uh, you have uh, you know international law, and, and maybe that can also be uh, kind of uh, um, you know a, a way to set up your, your closing remarks. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ben. And uh, you raise great points. Uh, you know, I was just reading uh, yesterday, we now have about uh, 5,000 satellites. And I think the astronomers are all up in arms because the number is projected to go up to 100,000. Uh, and we're already tracking about 40,000 uh, pieces of debris to the extent that our sensors can capture everything. So yes, we are looking at an extremely crowded, contested and congested, um, uh, you know, uh, orbital debris uh, space. Uh, so th there's no question that is uh, true. What I would say is that we need to balance the good with the um, with the bad in the sense that uh, I don't want to see the commercial activities in space sort of taking uh, 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 going back. I think that what we're on a wonderful path. There are really great things to admire about it, and it does. Uh, you know, it is kind of inspiring to see rockets go up and down, and our ability to be sort of uh, able to talk about the digital divide, to think that we can you know help a humanitarian intervention around the world. But there is, of course, it comes also with the possibilities uh, for uh, nefarious exits. So I always go around asking uh, people, you know, what is the problem? What is the policy problem that we need to solve in this new space race? I mean, we have democratization, we have commercializations, we have militarization. What is the policy problem that we're actually attempting to solve? Um, and I think part of the, the other thing I always say is that everything that's happening in space is rooted in the geopolitics on Earth. So the problem that we do need to address has to do with uh, where we are today. Uh, you know, we're in a great power competition, and so we need to figure out how to get along uh, on the ground with our competitors and our um, allies. The other thing that uh, Ben was uh, pointing out is that, uh, yes, of course, direct ascent missiles, uh, you know, they concentrate the mind even more than just conflict as the uh, ambassador. So, yes, of course, China did this in 2007. The U.S. followed up in 2008. India did it in 2019. Russia did it in uh, 2021. All that is very true. And then, yes, of course, here we are. The U.S. has declared uh, that, you know, they're going to start setting this norm of um uh, of uh, not having uh, this kind of ASAT uh, testing. But the genie is out of the bottle, yes? So how do you convince people uh, who, and that's great for the countries that have tested it, what kind of a message is it sending to the countries that are that want to test it and also want to showcase that they have these capabilities. So uh, it, it's important to keep the historical perspective and the timeline in mind as we think about norm setting behavior. Uh, and I think that what has gone in the orbital debris realm, the way that the processes have worked out are also equally important in the SSBD realm, how we do that. The problem in the SSBD realm is that while a missile can sort of, a direct descent missile can sort of concentrate mines very easily, the effects and the impacts that we see of all this SSBD, this imagery and data on the ground is much more diffuse. It's much more a spread across uh, people. So who will lead and how will this be done? I think that those are the issues that we need to begin to think about now if we want to ensure that these space assets are used in the interest of, uh, in the public interest worldwide. I think I will leave you with that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pekinen. That is an inspiring uh, way to end a discussion out of uh, on, on small satellites, big data. These are big ideas. I think that's the other thing. And, and um, that's that's what we're, trying to focus on here in terms of doing anticipatory diplomacy for the safe, safe and sustainable use of outer space. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Sadia Pakhtin of the University of Washington. Uh, this has been a presentation of the Space Diplomacy Lab of the Duke University Center for Global International Studies Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, we do want to uh, point out that, uh, that just uh, a, a little over a week from now is the first ever space diplomacy hackathon that's happening between June 4th to June 11th, uh, where the Space Diplomacy Lab of Duke is going to collaborate with uh, uh, Dr. Lindsey Gray's uh, uh, National Science Policy Network uh, Science Diplomacy Committee to welcome talented teams to, rent, to present their ideas on low Earth orbit and debris, uh, space debris, space technology's impact on conflict resolution and humanitarian aid, and lunar mine, mining and anticipatory diplomacy. So please Stay tuned uh, for much more. And um, until next time, as I always say, uh, for the Space Diplomacy Lab, thank you so much and keep looking up. Thank you. <laughs>